Today, along with my teammates Ashim and Ding Han, we are going to share the workflow system migration journey at Pinterest, uh, where we migrated from our legacy workflow system to Spinner, uh, which is our internal workflow systems uh, built on top of Airflow. And you will probably hear me mentioning the code name Spinner a couple few more times throughout today's presentation. And before we get started, I'd like to share that this has been the second year since we onboarded to Airflow. And this is the second time that we participate in the Airflow Summit. And in last year, we shared our experience onboarding to Airflow in general. And we really appreciate that uh, we get the chance to meet with all of you again this year to share how we finished the workflow system migration with Airflow. So with that being said, let's get started. So first, um, the agenda for today's session, uh, we will first share some context and background of why we did system migration and what was the scale we were looking at. And then we will get into the details of the approach that we took for the migration and the infra we built um, to power the system migration. And next, we will also share our experience on the system monitoring side that we did um, to make sure the system is, is in good status as well as some of the learnings that we had throughout the migration. And finally, we will open up for Q&A uh, if time permits. So first, a little bit of the background on why we did the migration. So in short, um, the decision to do the migration is really driven by the pain points that existed in our legacy workflow system that is called Pinball and Pinflow. So it had performance and scalability issue as system contains stateful components um, that are not scalable. And in addition, um, some key features were missing from Black system, such as the access control and auditing. And also it imposes um, heavy maintenance burden on the system admins in terms of the system upgrades. And not to mention that we have to maintain um, over 10 different clusters. And last but not least, um, it had a deep learning overhead for our users to onboard and didn't have sufficient documentations. So what was the scale of the migration we were looking at? So at the beginning of the migration, we had over 4,000 different workflows running across all the clusters that we had in the legacy workflow systems. And although these workflows are written in Python, they were using a um, completely different DSL than Airflow. And these workflows were built for various use cases, meaning that they have different customization logic as well as um, different priorities. So with this scale in mind, what were the approaches we had um, to move forward with this system migration? So first of all, we could simply ask the workflow owners to completely rewrite their workflow um, using Airflow's DSL but this would require too much efforts uh, from our user. We could also try to provide some tooling to do the DSL translation directly, but as mentioned uh, in the previous slide, that there were too many different customization logic inside the workflow. So it is very challenging to provide one solution that can covers all the different use case scenarios. So here comes the approach um, that we took so essentially, which is to build a migration layer into the Airflow scheduler and provide a transparent migration experience for our workflow owners. So, what, so we managed to achieve um, no user code changes throughout the migration in most of the uh, use cases and, and requires minimum user involvement. And during the scheduler processing, the legacy workflow definition will be translated into Airflow DAG on the fly. And the Kubernetes executor is used in our setup to mimic the execution environment of the legacy workflow jobs, where each job execution happens inside one dedicated Kubernetes pod. And this piece will be discussed in details in the infrastructure section. So next, let's get into the details into our migration approach. So this is an overview of the migration layer that we built um, on top of the native Airflow scheduler. As you can see from the left side of the graph, um, there are several key components uh, inside this migration layer, uh, which will be discussed in details in the next few slides. So we implemented a Pinterest stackback module um, that is able to parse stack objects out from a config file 
um, rather than the regular DAC file. And we call such config file as the migration metadata file. Once the migration metadata file is retrieved by the Pinterest stackback module, it calls into a token fetcher container that hosts the parser of the legacy workflow system to retrieve the actual workflow definition. And once retrieved, the legacy workflow and job definition will be translated into Airflow, Airflow DAX and tasks so that the Pinterest stackback module yields DAC objects just like the regular DACback. So next, let's take a closer look at uh, at these few components. The first will be the Pinterest stackback module. As mentioned in the background section, we are not doing the direct workflow DSO translation, uh, which means in our cases, we do not have the DAC file written in the Airflow's DSL for our migrated workflows. So the problem we really faced was that, is it possible to make the Airflow schedule works if we do not have the DAC file that contains the workflow definition. And the, and the way we really appre approached this problem is that we saw um, essentially a DAC file is just an identifier of one or more DACs. And for native Airflow, the DAC file happens to carry the workflow definition, but it is completely possible to compose the DAC file in a way that it doesn't contain the workflow definition directly, but points to the source where the definition is hosted as long as the DAC back module is able to understand and parse it. So you can see the flexibility here. So this Pinterest DAC back module was implemented uh, with this idea in mind. It is able to understand and parse the migration metadata file, which looks like the following. This file is generated when the migration of a workflow is initiated, and it contains the metadata which helps the Pinterest DAC back module to locate the definition of a, migration, of a migrated legacy workflow. So once the metadata is retrieved, the token fetcher container comes into play. The token fetcher container hosts the deposit of the legacy, workflows, uh, legacy workflow system and is running alongside with the migration scheduler. So it exposes API to retrieve the specification of a legacy workflow as well as parsing the job. So the job definition will be parsed into a data structure called job token, which contains the job execution specification and most importantly, the job execution command, which looks like the following. So with this token fetcher container, the Pinterest stack back module can invoke it to retrieve the specification and the job tokens of the workflow defined um, in the workflow, uh, in the migrated workflow the metadata file. Once the job tokens are retrieved, the next step is to convert them into the Airflow task. Sorry. Here, we implemented a customized operator called Pinboard on Kubernetes operator, um, and every job token is translated into it. So just for context, Pinboard is our Python model repo where the definition of all the legacy workflows reside. And this Pinboard on Kubernetes operator um, stores the execution command that is retrieved from the job token. And when it executes, it launches a Kubernetes pod, carries, in, carries the Pinboard build to run that command. So in this way, we can mimic the job execution environment of the legacy workflow system. And another feature that we utilize in our workflow, in our migration layer, is the serialized DAC feature. Um, and one important reason of doing this is to reduce the DAC parsing overhead as in the migration case, extra logics are introduced into the DAC parsing part, such as um, calling the token fetcher to retrieve the job tokens. So in our setup, we made the Pinterest DAC back module only calls into the token fetcher to retrieve the workflow specification and job tokens when the serialized DAC doesn't exist in the database. And when a new DAC run is to be, uh, of this migrated DAC is to be created, the scheduler will call into the token fetcher container again to retrieve the latest job tokens and pick up the latest change. Once, well, one thing to note is that uh, in addition to the scheduler side, we also utilize the serialized DAC in the UI rendering. So there's no need for us to launch the token fetcher container alongside with the web server. And in addition, since the prop properties carried uh, required by the execution of the pinboard on Kubernetes executor as uh, operator, sorry, are not serializable, 
So we are using the serialized DAC feature in the execution of the migrated tasks as well. Um, during our migration, we find that one major feature that is missing from Airflow but is required by our workflow migration is something called dynamic DAC. And the use case is that the layout of a DAC is not deterministic and can dynamically change between DAC runs. So for instance, say we have a DAC to process the data sets from upstream, and for each data set that is um, complete and ready to be processed, a task will be added to the DAC. So you can see that the layout of this DAC is not a determined, it's, it's, it's determined by those upstream data sets. An expectation for such cases is that the DAC layout is determined and fixed when a new DAC run is scheduled. And the, and the computed layout will not will, will be saved and the execution of the DAC run will stick to the execution plan. So that the worker can just load the tasks from this saved layout and does not need to do the DAC parsing and the compu and, and compute the DAC layout during the execution as very likely um, the DAC parsing happened inside the worker from the worker side may result in different DAC layout. So to bring this feature into Airflow, we designed a new DAC type called dynamic DAC to support the dynamic layout use cases. So the dynamic DAC exposes a compute layout method. And, and instead of defining the task at the top level in a DAC file, the task instantiation logic needs to be encapsulated inside this compute layout method. And this method is only involved when a new DAC run is to be created to generate the layout of the DAC at that given time. And this, and this layout snapshot will be saved and, be, and, and, bound, and will be bounded to the DAC run. In this way, the layout computation logic, which can potentially be very heavy, won't be invoked, invoked each time when the DAC is being parsed. Moreover, although this feature was originally built for the migration case, it can be used with native Airflow as well. So finally, to facilitate and streamline the migration process for our workflow owners, we design different toolings to help them with the migration. So first, we build a migration tool with, the, with a nice UI interface for workflow owners to initiate the workflow migration. Um, so this tool is integrated with the options to unschedule workflows from the Lexi workflow system um, to migrate it to Spinner, which is, again, our internal workflow system built on top of Airflow. And it also has options to roll back the migration um, if anything went wrong. So once the workflow um, is migrated, the migration is initiated, um, its migration metadata file will be uploaded to S3 and is discoverable by our migration workflow, uh, migration scheduler which we will discuss in details in a later slide. And by exposing this migration tool to our users, we did not do the workflow migration all at once, but instead um, the users can control the migration pace of their workflows. For instance, they can start with the workflow that have lower priority and monitoring those workflows first to validate um, the migration can work for their use cases. And at the end of the workflow migration, we also introduced an auto indexing tool to automatically migrate newly added workflows to Spinner. This was because after the deprecation of the Lex system, we required that all the new workflows written in the Lexi workflow systems DSL must be migrated to Spinner. And with the help of this tool, users do not need to go to the migration tool every time they have a new workflows. Um, but but just but this auto index tool can help them to migrate their newly added workflow, which helped with the dev velocity of our workflow, of our workflow owners. And that's pretty much all for the approach section. And next, I will pass it to my teammate, Ding Hang, to talk about infrastructure that we built um, to support the workflow migration. Hi, um, thank you, Yulei. Hi, everyone. This is Ding Hang from Pinterest. Now I'm going to give a quick talk about the infrastructure part to support the migration. So as we really mentioned at the very beginning, there are several pain points. And the most important one is the performance and scalability issue. So when we are leveraging Airflow, we actually take that into serious consideration. So we are thinking we, we should use the Kubernetes executor to work with. 
So from here, this is the Kubernetes integration diagram. On the left side, that's the spinner system, which is the airflow-based workflow system at Pinterest. And on the right-hand side, that's the Kubernetes cluster. So every time there are some new tasks to be running, so the scheduler in the spinner will send those tasks to the task's queue. And the spinner Kubernetes executor, it also has a scheduler. It will try to fetch those tasks from the task queue and send them to the Kubernetes cluster via the job submission service. So in this case, for native one, every task will have its own pod to execute the airflow command. And for migrate case, at the very beginning, we also start one worker pod for running the airflow command. And while it's running, it will realize it's a migrate case. So it will start another pod for running the migrate task command. And the, the, later on, we actually enhanced this situation to use the merger pod feature. In that case, even for migrate task, there would only be one migrate task worker pod for executing both the airflow command and the migrate task command. From here, we can see there are a lot of pros. The first one is great scalability. Compared to the pre-provisioned nodes in the legacy workflow system, like there are limited nodes and every node has limited slots. But right now with Kubernetes cluster, the resource is shared by the whole company. So there are way more resources than we need for running workflow tasks. In that case, that's great scalability. Even if we have to run like 3000 or more tasks at the, at the current moment, we can easily spin off 3000 or more tasks pods for them. And also, as, as we can see from this diagram, it's great isolation for tasks because it's every task is running running in its own worker pod, which means they won't be affected by each ta other task. Not like a legacy workflow system, several tasks are running on the same node. In that case, if one task went wrong and affected a node, all the tasks will be affected on the same node. So within the Kubernetes environment, every pod will only affect its, itself, so they won't be affected by others. And also it's easy maintenance upgrade. So with the legacy workflow system, we have to drain the worker node to make sure nothing is running on that node, then we can do the upgrade. But with the Kubernetes cluster, it's really easy. We just need to upgrade the image and then the next run of the task will be using the new image. So that's free maintenance and up upgrade for us. And also it's better security because every task now running in its own worker part, which means we can have different security settings such as IAM roles, knocks, and other services to make sure each part will have better security. And also we cannot ignore those cons. The first thing is the integration with the Pinterest in-house Kubernetes setup. As we may know, Airflow itself has a Kubernetes executor, but that's open source Kubernetes executor. We cannot use that right away because it's a different setting at Pinterest. So we have to leverage the new APIs and customize a lot in the Airflow to use the Pinterest Kubernetes cluster. But that's just one time thing. We can easily overcome that. And the second thing is the pod resource setup. So in the legacy system, one node can be very powerful. Even one task is using more memory or CPU, it can easily be covered by the node. So auto memory issues is kind of rare. But what, with the Kubernetes cluster, every part is newly created. And before we create that, we have to know the task resource usage for it and define it in the pod spec. In that case, if we don't know the resource usage, it will be very easy to cause some out of memory issues. But we also get that outcome. We will talk about that in a later slide. And the last thing we cannot ignore is the pod warm-up cost. So every pod is newly created, and we have to wait a pod, wait for the pod to be created, and wait those, wait for the image to be downloaded, and also wait for the readiness for those services like DBS3 Knox. So there are like more times needed for us to wait for the for executing the airflow command. Based on our experience, it's a little, a little bit more than like one minute, but for batching process, it's kind of acceptable. And also we are working with Kubernetes team to reduce the warm-up cost. And then now let's focus on the enhanced migrate task case with migrate task worker pod to take a look of the pod generation and pod execution. So this is a sequence diagram for pod generation. From top, we can see there are three components like Kubernetes executor, worker configuration, and container configure, pinboard container configuration for the migrate task container. 
And on the right-hand side, that's the Kubernetes cluster. So whenever a Kubernetes executor get a request to start a pod, so it will try to send the request to the worker configuration. And the worker configuration is responsible to use the template to set up the pod spec, especially the Airflow worker main container, and do the resource allocation for it. Also, since it's a migrate task, it will try to get the migrate task containers back as well. That's where the pinboard container configuration comes into the play. So it will try to do the similar thing, use the template to set up the pinboard container and also do a smart resource allocation and then return the spec back to the worker configuration. So the worker configuration will combine those information together and then return the whole migrate task part back to the Kubernetes executor. And the Kubernetes executor will use that part of spec, send that to the Kubernetes cluster to create this migrate task worker part. So now the pod generated, let's take a look at the pod execution. So this is the real pod. As you can see, there are like two important containers. One is the Airflow Worker container and one is the Pinboard container for migrate task. So there are actually more containers, but we will just focus on these two for now. So the Airflow Worker container will try to run the Airflow task command and it realizes it's a migrate task. So it will try to generate the migrate task command and send it to the pinboard container to do the execution. And while the pinboard container is executing the task command, it will return the task command process ID back to the Airflow container. And then meanwhile, it's streaming those logs to a local log file. So the Airflow worker container will use this process ID to check about the task execution and pull, it, and pull the new logs and then populate those logs to the Airflow task logs. In that case, users can see all those logs, new logs from UI directly. And uh, then Airflow Worker Container will also depend on the migrate task command execution to update the, the task status accordingly. So during the pod generation and the pod execution, we actually did a lot of pod customization and smart toolings. So we will pick up several ones to talk about. The first thing is the optional sidecar. So as I mentioned, there are actually more sidecars and containers than that two main containers. They are something like mail, Envoy, and MC router, which is for the storage caching services. So those can also use some resources, but they are not required by every task. So we are making them optional and the users can configure them at the task level to save resources. And meanwhile, user, if there are some changes, they want to adjust that, there will be a very easy way for them to do the adjustment via the managed data, which is the key file store, which can be reflected right away during runtime. And similar thing for the memory and CPU. As I mentioned before, there's a very good smart resource allocation from our side. What we are doing is like, we will collect all the resource usage info for successful runs for each task for a long time. And then we will use that information to predict the memory usage and the CPU usage and plus some buffer when we are creating the pod. And later on, if user, they know how much memory they got, they're gonna use or they want to use more memories, they can always configure that at the task level. And also if something changes during runtime, they can easily up adjust that via the managed data as well to reflect the changes during runtime. So they don't need to make any code changes to make the job pass. And another important thing is about the reparenting feature. So every system, system can have a downtime, including Kubernetes cluster. If something went wrong for a node and all the parts on that will be removed and deleted. In that case, let's say our task can be running for hours or even days. We definitely don't want to restart the task all from the beginning. So that's why we introduced this repairing feature. Let's take a look at this sequence diagram. Many of our tasks are like Hadoop tasks, Spark tasks, and Spark SQL tasks. So those tasks, tasks they're running on the Pinterest computer engine. So the heavy execution is happening there. And in that case, let's see, there's a task part. We will use Hadoop job as an example. It's submitting the Hadoop job to the computer engine and computer engine will be able to do the execution. And it will also return the job ID back to the task part. And task part will then save the job ID associated with the task information in the MySQL DB. 
So at that moment, if the node went wrong for some reason and the task part is gone, there will be another part started for the task. And the part will confirm itself as a restart part. And in that case, it will be able to get a job ID from the MySQL DB and use that job ID to check the job status at the Pinterest computer engine site. If the job at the computer engine site is still running, it will be able to easily repair that to the existing job. In that case, we can save hours or days for our task execution if something went wrong for a Kubernetes node. Last but not least, let's also take a look at the Kubernetes security. So for better in ensure the security for data privacy, we actually created three separate environments. One is the production spinner, one is the PI spinner, and the last one is the SOX PI spinner. In that case, every environment, they would have different web server access and different DBs and also the IAM roles to better secure the data privacy. And also the second thing is like for PI environment and SOX environment, we actually have Spiffy ID based on the project and which is also at the task level, which means users can actually configure different service accessibilities as, at the task level. Furthermore, we are onboarding users to use fine green access control. So tasks can have FGAC account info associated with them. In that case, we can ensure the specific data only to specific tasks. Now, let me hand it to our coworker soon to talk about the CICD pipeline and the monitoring. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dinhang. Uh, hi, I'm Asim, and I'm data sorry at Pinterest, and uh, I'll be walking us through our CI/CD pipeline and uh, some important metrics that uh, we use to monitor our spinner system. Uh, so first, uh, I would like to introduce you to our CI-CD pipeline that uh, we have for the native DAG case. Uh, we have a dedicated DAG repo where we uh, store all our uh, native DAGs. And uh, when the user lands their code, uh, it triggers a Jenkins build that runs uh, DAG unit tests. And we also run some DAG validation. As part of the DAG validation check, we're checking for uh, important uh, attributes we want to uh, put in place, uh, example, uh, tiers and uh, SLOs and uh, project owners and also Kubernetes requests and uh, check, uh, put some process in place. Uh, this also helps us with uh, to reduce our code review burden as well. And once the validation check looks good, we are publishing our DAGs to S3 bucket that gets consumed uh, by our uh, production system uh, through use of our DAG syncer. And currently our native build times are around eight minutes and deploys takes uh, less than a minute. Uh, pretty happy with this setup. And uh, the second CI-CD pipeline is for the migration case to, uh, to provide continuous support for our legacy workflows. It's a bit more involved where uh, we subscribe to artifacts that are uh, published by our um, Mono repo, where uh, we store our workflow definitions and common libraries. Uh, previously, we used to consume it as a tarball, but uh, but as we migrated to Spinner system, uh, we are, we built a Docker image uh, out of the artifact, uh, and uh, the Jenkins pipeline currently uh, runs at a actually at a 30 minute interval. And uh, once the image is built, we uh, Publish that to our staging environment, where it gets uh, where we run integration test suite against uh, the the newly built image. And uh, if the test looks good, we uh, promote it to our for our production usage. Uh, for uh, in this pipeline, we still uh, have retained our hotfix and rollback uh, features uh, that we previously had from our Teletran, uh, which is our internal orchestrator. And uh, the legacy workflow build times, uh, along with integration tests for the migration case is around one hour and the deploy times uh, around three minutes. Taking a deeper look into our integration test suite, uh, on the right-hand side chart, this is a representation of our integration test uh, DAG that um, 
So in the first task, we could see um, a, a, sub, a step where we are updating the token fetcher image. Um, uh, once this uh, step is completed, on the, se the second task represents all of the integration test suites that we would like to kick off. And these workflows are owned and uh, written by various teams at Pinterest and uh, provides good coverage for all the different operators that we utilize in production. And on the third, uh, you could uh, this represents all the sensors that are checking for the workflow the, for the DAG task completions. And once the DAG completion, uh, once all of the jobs have completed, the final task is to trigger the Jenkins build, which uh, retags the staging image that was used in this integration test uh, for use in production. All right, and now moving on to the deployment side of things. Uh, so uh, all of our DAG files and uh, the migration metadata files are published to, uh, published to S3. And we have a DAG syncer service running alongside uh, our spinner services um, that syncs uh, the DAGs based on two attributes, the, sch uh, the scheduler tier and the partition. And as we can see, the deployment times are less than you know, like there are around eight seconds. Uh, this then gets processed by our Pinterest stack back module, and uh, and uh, this uh, pipeline actually supports deployment for both our migration and native case. Um, a little bit, a little bit background on our scheduler architecture. So each of the scheduler has a tier associated with it, and each tier has SLO defined. Uh, for example, tier one, we have promised to. Uh, provide SLO for a scheduled delay of within uh, two minutes, we would, be, we would have a uh, job scheduled. And to reach those SLO goals, we, have, uh, we are making use of DAC partitioning. And we introduce a new DAC partition uh, once we hit 90th percentile of our SLO. Uh, and, um, and this is um, our scheduler partitioning. And a quick look into our workload and uh, how that ties up to our infrastructure. Uh, currently, for a, these are uh, this over here represents actually uh, three different environments that we have in our in Spinner system: the production, PI, and SOX. The production is a, has a much uh, higher workload compared to the PI and SOX here. So I'll only be talking about the production environment and I just put these uh, numbers out here for reference. Uh, but to support a, a concurrent task run of about 5,000, um, we're making use of uh, three web servers. Uh, we have about 600 users that are accessing the web and uh, 10 schedulers ranging from C54X large to C518X large. And the K8 memory coda that have been that has been allocated for this task is about 160 terabyte, and for the CPU around 90k virtual CPUs. And uh, right now we have a, a leader follower uh, model for our MySQL database, and um, we're using C5D9x large for that case. All right, moving on to monitoring. Uh, for our monitoring use case, we have various dashboards. Uh, and we break them uh, out based on uh, different components that make up the scheduler, uh, sorry, the spinner system. But uh, we also have one dashboard uh, that provides us with an overview of the, a bird's eye view of the system performance. And one of them is the system SLO, which gives us an end-to-end -end performance of our spinner system as it uh, represents all the components that make up the spinner system. And to, in order to do that, we have a scheduled job running at 15 minute interval. Uh, so we expect four DAG runs to complete every hour. And on this day, uh, we could see there were some issues uh, with our uh, system level SLO. I believe there was some uh, network issues in a Amazon that day. And uh, for our scheduling, scheduler SLO here represents our uh, DAG scheduling delay SLO and that are uh, tied to our tiers. And we also closely monitor that. And um, so these are the various components that make up our spinner system. And we have a dashboard for each one of these components, but 
Uh, I'm just uh, mentioning all the different metrics here, but I would only like to uh, talk about the ones that we uh, found uh, that weren't obvious to us, but we found uh, useful as we ran into issues. And uh, one of the, the, for the scheduler, we recently added a scheduler heartbeat. Uh, so uh, we were uh, facing issues where like uh, there was some scheduling delay and uh, we did not have much insight into that. So we introduced scheduler heartbeat, as you could see in this diagram on the right hand side, uh, where the yellow highlight is, we see some metrics missing. This uh, quickly gave us insight and we alerted us so we could go and check uh, out what the issue was around that time. And we noticed the scheduler appeared stuck and uh, this uh, can, and we also noticed one of the possible reasons for this is a uh, huge dynamic DAG that generates uh, tons of DAGs and tasks that can lead to this. And um, also the number of failed tasks is also very important and uh, gives us a quick insight into whether our system is uh, behaving normally. And uh, the other things that we look closely at is the queue buildup, the executor queue buildup for the task. Uh, it can also over time as, uh, so if the tasks build up in the queue or remain in the queue for long periods of time, this could mean there is a system overload and this directly correlates with the concurrent task run across stack configuration per scheduler. And um, some other useful uh, metrics that I would like to call out is to have uh, the number of case running tasks versus the number of worker pods here. The disparity here uh, would mean there are more pods running than the number of uh, running tasks. This usually means the, uh, the task most likely has completed, but uh, there are some pods that are continuing to run and uh, using a valuable Kubernetes resource. In our in our case, uh, this was the issue of trying to upload a very large uh, task log, and that resulted in OM kill of the child container, the migration pod container, where that uh, and the, the parent container, the the worker pod would continue to wait uh, to receive response and uh, there would be these orphaned uh, pods just consuming uh, resource here. And uh, for everything, system monitoring is very important. Uh, and for our web server uh, use case, uh, we noticed uh, as we were adding more DAGs and, and uh, more users were onboarding onto Spinner system, some of the page view load times were getting impacted. So in order to uh, improve user experience and to catch them before our users, we introduced a monitoring for uh, a load time view per page. And this has helped us keep our users happy. And uh, for the database, uh, since it's in the critical path, it always uh, comes into all the spinner uh, performance equation and we closely monitor for uh, all of the QPS metrics and read write response times and uh, system level metrics as well. And the DAX syncer here uh, helps us uh, know that we are uh, delivering our changes to our production boxes in time. And um, so these are some of the monitoring metrics that we learned along the way that uh, we would like to share with you. And uh, now I would like to hand over the presentation to Dinha. Thank you, Sue. Now let's talk about the learnings. During the migration process, we actually concluded some takeaways that could potentially benefit other companies who are doing something similar, migrating to Airflow. So first of all, those are the keys to a success migration process based on our experience. The first thing is like we need to understand and fulfill the gaps between the Airflow and our in-house workflow system before the migration, such as the feature gap and the security difference and terminologies. And during the migration, we actually create a very great migration tool to help users to minimum the burdens for them. They just need to perform several clicks, clicks to do the migration and uh, as well as the flow verification. And also we did very good uh, clear user communication and the onboarding materials such as wikis, training sessions and Slack support. So they can get help anytime, get the information from the uh, wikis as well. 
And also we did some features to make sure the scalability is great. And also there are very great um, CICD pipelines to make sure the system is consistent, reliable, and efficient. And also a lot of tests and integration tests are introduced within the staging environment to prevent um, bad changes getting into product. And last but not least, we actually have very comprehensive metrics and iterative alerts along the way to help us alert us whenever there's something wrong with our system. And there are also some points we need to be careful about. So there could be risk condition during the migration. We have to guarantee the schedule is aligned before and after the migration. And also the resource provision, such as memory setup for each task is way different from the previous pro, uh, pre pro vision nodes. So we have to understand the memory and the CPU usage for each task before we create the parts. And also the part warm up cost and the part redundant sidecar cost also is very important. And also with about invest in user education and user support cost. And they're also a very um, important increased overhead of the hybrid solution for maintaining the old DSL and the new one. And we have to keep both systems alive for a while. Before we get into the Q&A session, we'd like to mention there's another session from our team. It's about usability improvements. We've done a lot of work to create new features that can help increase the user experience and also that those features are loved by our users, but not in Airflow yet. Feel free to check that out. That's it. Thank you.